Okay. Um, do you want to start? Sure. Or? Hello, I am Lauren Stoll. And I'm Abby Cox. And I'm Shaney McKnight. And you're like a subsidiary sort of, of yes. American Duchess, but we're from American Duchess and Royal Vintage Shoes. Uh -huh. And Not Your Mama's History, yes. which you, you heard her say. Uh, so the company side of what we do makes historic reproduction footwear. Anything from, and I'll show you guys, anything from about the, now it's about 18th century to the 19, late 1940s. And that started from my blog way back when. I started a blog in 2008 talking about historic dress, dress making. And it sort of developed into a footwear company because I couldn't find any shoes to wear with the dresses that I was making. That company started in 2011, and we fast forward to today, and I employ amazing people like Abby, Nicole Rudolph, Christina D'Angelo, and we do cool stuff. So we make historic shoes, and then we also write books. <laughs> like patterns and... <laughs> patterns and YouTube videos and media podcasts. and all, all kinds of fun stuff and, and still blogging. Yeah. And that's why we're here today, is we've written two books. One is called The American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Dressmaking. Did I get it right? I think so. Don't ask me. I always get it wrong. I just like make it up a title. I'm like, eh. It's, it's like a crazy long title. And then the second book, The American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Beauty, which is what we're going to talk about and demonstrate today. So as she said, you can ask questions while we're doing this. I'm going to do Abby's hair. And then Cheney, Cheney worked on an essay in the book that talks specifically about black women's hair and how it was dealt with in the 18th century. Very, very interesting. So if you get a hold of the book or you have it, definitely read her essay mm -hmm. on it because it presents some uh, problematic things that we would love for you to talk about while we're doing Abby's hair today. Um, yeah. So normally, this is actually kind of funny. Uh, Lauren and I actually normally do our own hair. So she hasn't <laughs> actually done my hair since the book. Yeah. And it was a different style. And it was a completely different style. So just a heads up, this is going to be probably fairly comedic. Also, uh, want to thank very quickly April yes. uh, for setting this up and connecting everyone together and working with us and collaborating. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So it's really awesome to be here. It's to be here. Um, oh, we have a question already. Um, I know you're talking about the dressmaking and you're talking about hairstyles. Are you going to talk a little bit about adornment and jewelry and, and, and how the... If you have a specific question as we're going, we can do our best to answer. Jewelry is not something that we're actually that well versed in. It is kind of its own thing. Um, so, so the book doesn't cover jewelry. We do cover millinery, which are accessories. So like caps and hoods and hats and things like that. But jewelry, like that, I'm going to be really straightforward. That's not really our area of expertise. We can yeah. battle axe through some stuff, but it's <laughs> any sort of like detail, like, yeah. Um, Sure. Yeah. yeah, we can cover that of like, you know, the boots in your hair. Right. I'm getting ready. I'm getting <laughs> just like rubbing out. Yeah. Uh, you know, the coral jewelry that I'm wearing, uh, what, you know, tying a ribbon around your neck. We can talk about that if you have spe specific questions. Um, Taylor of Damsel La Mode is an expert in 18th century jewelry, and she also recreates it for your, yeah. for, for your boudoir. Um, and she's really the one online to contact and ask about jewelry. Yeah. Okay, so let's get started. So what I'm doing right now is I have my pomade, and I will show you guys what this looks like. This is made from lamb, callow, and pig lard. Lamb, callow, and pig lard. It is animal fat. It has been rendered and rinsed and cleaned and all the gamey, nasty smell removed. And then it is scented with stuff like lavender, citrus flavors, rosemary. Smells that keep pests away, particularly clove. So we're going to myth bust throughout this. First myth, did they have rats, vermins, and lice in their hair? No. The answer is no. <laughs> it's Everything hard, that we're putting in Abby's hair is strongly scented. And that is to keep the pests away. So that includes the powder as well. Mm -hmm. So before I get started on this with my greasy, greasy hands, the powder is starch. It is not flour. This happens to be cornstarch, but in the 18th century, they would have used very fine wheat starch, although very low grades of powder could be other things. Lime, plaster of Paris, chalk, clay. Stuff you do not want to put yeah, in your hair. Yeah, stuff you don't want to put in your hair. Now, the reason that we use starch is because starch acts, interacts with the animal fat in a way that creates a wonderful, pliable, sculptable 
hair. Mm -hmm. Which you will see this happen as we do this on Abby. Yeah. They did not have hairspray in the 18th century. And so the question is, how did they get those big, tall hairstyles if they don't have hairspray? And this is how they got those hairstyles. Mm -hmm. This is not the only reason, though, for pomade and powder. Pomade and powder was also how 18th century men and women cleaned their hair. And I think the best person to talk about that is you. It's me. Um, so before I worked for American Duchess, I, I actually worked at Colonial Williamsburg, which is kind of where this rabbit hole started. It's also how Cheney and I know each other. Um, and we were working on a project to recreate basically like a tableau from a print. And the hairstyles that these women were wearing were very large and very fashionable. And I was like, all right, well, how do we do this without doing a wig? You know, because it's like the wig is what a lot of people go to, and everyone talks about wigs, and everyone assumes in the 18th century everyone wore wigs. And it, it was like, well, that's not really the case. Like, you don't see actually see that in visual, in visual imagery of portraitures and fashionable women. You see natural hairlines, you see this, and you see hairdressers and, and stuff. So, long story short, I went down this rabbit hole and. I started making the pomades, I found the recipes, I found the hair powder recipes, I started sourcing things. And then I became obsessed with the idea once I realized what it did to the hair. Because I have really, really fine, straight, thin, not exciting hair. Very shitty. And I shed a lot. Yeah, it's already happening. Uh, sorry. <laughs> oh my bad. Um, and so I grew up my whole life not being able to do squat with my hair. It was like, oh, and now it's straight. there. Not even like straight. It was just like limp there. Thin. And I, I went as a teenager during the time of straightening irons. And you're like, but why? And I was like, I don't need help. <laughs> it's like the wet dog look. Um, just like, mm -hmm. So when I pomade and powdered my hair, all of a sudden I was like in an herbal essence commercial, you know? Like just like, oh yeah, like living my best Vera Fawcett life. Um, and I was fascinated by this because we hear all these myths, we see all these myths, you know, and, and they are constantly perpetuated. So I wanted to know, because where else in the world could I actually pomade and powder my hair all the time, every day, just like an 18th century woman would, without being completely, like, people going, you got, like, dandruff problems, you know? So I, I did it for an entire year, and I, I write about it briefly in the, a little essay in the book. For an entire year, I pomaded and powdered my hair. Uh, the only times I washed my hair was when I was visiting my grandmother, because that's what you do, because grandma. Um, and or if I was like at the gym and I worked out really really hard and I got really really sweaty, because um, I lived in Virginia and it was hot. Um, but I pomaded and powdered my hair, and what I found is that when my hair started to stink, like that you know greasy hair smell when you haven't washed it in a few days, like that. That would go about every two weeks for me, and the moment I would then pomade and powder my hair, kind of do like a fresh coat, if you will, my scalp felt better, the oil was absorbed, it didn't stink, it smelled nice and clean, and I was able to do hairstyles, just kind of the basic 18th century hairstyles, very, very quickly. Um, because with anything, once you train your hair to do something, it holds it really well, right? Um, for example, you have kind of like a slightly off-center part right now. I bet your hair just kind of assumes the position, doesn't it? Yeah. If you tried to part it on the other way, I bet it kind of goes, whoa, right? Because it's trained that way. Um, and so with 18th century hairdressing, I found it was actually very, very easy to do. All of those myths about it being dirty or smelly or bacony or things like that, none of it was actually true. <laughs> um, but it was... Uh, satire at the time loved to make fun of yeah women and, and men doing this to their hair um, and so it was it was a really interesting experiment and then the more research I did that's when I realized wait clove oil is a natural pest repellent for flea and ticks for dogs and cats you know and this is what they're using in the pomade and the powder you know they're using scents that are pest deterrents that we even use today so that whole idea that it attracted lice well, it's just not true. And then you go down and you start reading about like lice, and what you realize is that actually smell this. dirtier hair, lice are less attracted to dirtier hair. Lice will, will go to anything. Like, it, it's not like one or the other, but they actually prefer cleaner hair. So that's one of the reasons why children get it, because they're always like, you know, super scrubbed clean. And so it deterred lice, 
It deterred fleas and other bugs and vermin. And when you read the hairdressing manuals, and I was actually a bad, I had bad 18th century hygiene, because I never combed my hair every day. And that's what they say in the books, comb your hair every day. You know, comb it, plait it, put it up, sleep on it, dress it, comb, 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 comb. Fresh pomade, it helps with the hair growth, it helps keep it nourished and everything like that. Um, and I wasn't even that good about it, but all of those rumors, all of that mythology surrounding 18th century hair, it just wasn't true. And what I found is I had voluminous hair that did whatever I wanted it to do. And it looked great. And then over time, probably about a week, the powder would eventually like disappear. My hair wouldn't be shiny like our hair is today. Like people, we have a strong value of shiny hair because we associate shiny hair with clean hair. It wasn't shiny but it wasn't powdered either. And then that was when I started to put together some stuff in portraiture. Because in some portraits in the 18th century, you see really, really heavily powdered hair. But then in some portraits, you don't. But the hair's not shiny. And that's what I started to look for in portraiture. It's like, ah, so this is actually like someone who's powdered their hair like a week ago. And versus someone who has a fresh, like, palm and pal, as I like to call it. Uh, <laughs> So, so yeah, it was a really interesting experience. And I think it's interesting, too, that today we, we're shifting away from shampooing all the time. You know, there's a whole no-poop movement. You can buy dry shampoo anywhere now. Like, when I was a teenager, and I'm 33, just in case you guys are curious. Um, so in the early 2000s, that time period, <laughs> uh, you couldn't find dry shampoo anywhere. It wasn't a thing. It wasn't a thing. Um, but now it is, and so we're already kind of shifting that way. So I think it's interesting from modern people and modern uh, women and men who take care of their hair, 18th century hair care is actually kind of what we don't even think about it, but we're kind of naturally heading that way, um, around away from washing all the time to, to figuring out other ways to do it. Now what's interesting about pomade and powdery is that it is the hygienic way that Western women took care of their hair and men. However, for women of color in America, that wasn't necessarily the case. So I'm going to pass it over to Katie now, since this is a really interesting juxtaposition within, within the United States and cultures about what uh, women of color would do. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so when I first started in living history or reenacting, I started in the hobby side. Um, and I found that no one in the hobby actually knew much about what black women were wearing. Um, I got a lot of comments of, just you wearing what white women wear, but a little shabbier. Um, and I knew from um, the portraiture, um, from images from the 18th century on up to the 19th century um, that it was that it was a very specific, specific style that they're wearing. Um, and then I started asking, um, how are they doing their hair? What's underneath their hair? Um, what I found was very interesting for 18th century. Um, I found that uh, especially enslaved men, um, black men were um, putting their hair up exactly how you would see in the wigs. Um, and as well as how you see them doing their hair, but they're not using pomade as much pomade. They're not teasing it. They're using their natural hair texture to achieve those styles. Um, so they are, what was it, the, the, um, the Yankee Doodle. Yankee Doodle Dandy? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, the macaroon style. Um, so I found a lot of those styles in the portraiture. Um, and at first, I was like, are those wigs? Are, those, are, they, are they wearing wigs? No, they're using their natural hair texture. They're molding it into these styles. And then they're powdering their hair. Um, they're doing this. Um, on the weekends, so um, specifically I looked at uh, Virginia and South Carolina. Um, so these are places where they're working in tobacco plantations. And so there's this whole other culture um, 
around the plantation outside of um, their work life. Uh, so sometimes um, the usual, our hangout on Friday nights, um, you see enslaved men attempting to see their families on other plantations. Um, and that's when they're doing their hair. Um, sometimes there are gatherings. We see festivals, um, corn shucking festivals, um, as well as um, at the end of the season when the crop comes in for uh, tobacco, there are special occasions um, in which the enslaved community comes together. Uh, sometimes it's been five, six, seven months and, since parents have seen their children on other plantations, and this is a big deal. Uh, so they're getting ready, they're doing their hair up, and this is an affair. Um, I also um, looked at the everyday life of enslaved women. How were they doing their hair? So we see, um, actually my hair um, is the per perfect example of what the average um, African woman, enslaved African woman in a tobacco plantation would have been wearing her hair like. Um, this is very simple. Um, and they're coming from West Africa. Um, Africa in general just has about 3,000 ethnic groups um, and each one has a very specific way in which they do their hair and how that communicates with the outside world. Um, this takes time um, and it's a very important part of these communities and I found that some of that was lost initially in coming to uh, North America but as you start to see more women arrive you start to see these um, these hair care routines returning. So I found wrapping. So taking or stringing, uh, taking a bit of hair. I wish I had hair to actually <laughs> try this out. Uh, taking a piece of hair and taking string. Um, I found that they sometimes use eel skin and you just wrap it and wrap it and wrap it and wrap it. And that is um, to this day, a hair stretching method or straightening method for black women. Um, and what I found is that that's what's underneath those head wraps. So usually they're a stringing style, which is very common, or cornrows. So cornrows are one of the oldest hairstyles in the world. Um, and so that's sometimes you see underneath the head wraps. Um, you can see that in moments in images in which you can see the side um, and you can see the cornrows coming down. Um, that wouldn't have been intentional to see that, but sometimes your head wrap shifts and you see those in images. And um, I just found so many interesting things and in asking those questions because um, like you all, when you don't have shoes, there's no one making shoes for you to wear for your wardrobe. Um, nobody, um, there was no research yet on um, what to do underneath the head wrap, which also helps me uh, wrap my hair. Um, and so that's kind of... Watch the first. They know, I, uh, I have a lot of... Uh, burns on my uh, dresses, my <laughs> not a good track record. Um, so from one step to another, I was just trying to figure out what were they wearing. Um, my constantly questioning what was their life like? What was their everyday life like? Um, and there's no way as someone um, in the year 2019, there's no way that I can understand. Um, but for two minutes, I can have a moment where I am standing in the exact garments that they're wearing, and that's important to me. Um, and that's something that I can share with um, the women and young ladies that I teach. Um, we can always walk around in someone's shoes for uh, two seconds. Um, and it also brings me closer to the ancestors. Uh, if anyone has any questions. Oh, yes. Do you have a blog or a YouTube channel? I do have a YouTube channel. Um, and that's actually how I 
uh, before, that's how we connected. Okay. Um, I have Not Your Mama's History YouTube okay. channel. Um, I really need to update it. Uh, <laughs> these things are from like 2015, so that's the quality of video I'm working with. <laughs> um, uh, so I specialize in, um, in head wraps. So from the 18th uh, century all the way up to the 20th. Um, and it really, I didn't really care about hair, but I realized um, about four years ago that I had to understand what was going underneath the head wraps to understand the structure of the head wraps. That's also important. Um, because when talking about West African hairstyles, um, those were the basis for other styles. So if you don't know how to string, if you don't know how to cornrow, there's no way you can understand what else is going on with the hair. What, what, oh, oh there's a question. Oh, um, yes. Where did you find your images? Oh, all over. Um, I found that once I started, um, I had entered a community of people from museums all over the world. So people started sending me images um, and references, even uh, wonderful Abby as well. Um, when she was in CW, she um, started slipping me some information as well. And, um, and then also just going into um, historical societies. Um, and there are still paintings and images who haven't, that hasn't been uploaded onto the World Wide Web, so I rely a lot on um, historians and researchers around the world to send me information. Um, it, it's really helped um, having an online platform because people always, always get emails, even just this morning getting an email uh, with, a, with a painting um, found in Ghana, so it's really cool. Is there, is there anyone whose hands raised back there? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, at this point, you can see my hair should be starting to shift in color, texture. It's probably looking a little bit more voluminous right now. Lauren is working super fast yep. uh, <laughs> because we still have to dress it. Luckily, it's a really easy style. Um, so hair shapes. This is something interesting too. Um, when you think of 18th century, you think of really tall hair, right? Like just like, <laughs> right? Um, and what's fascinating about that is that it did exist, but it was actually a really, really short moment. <laughs> Sorry, I had. Well, you can only get some more. Hair shapes, uh, especially in the last half of the 18th century, which is um, one of the reasons why we, we chose in the book to start like, you know, 17, like 50s, 60s ish, like Madame Pompadour, and then go forward. And we didn't really address the first half of the century because. It's, well, especially in England, it's boring. Um, it's like, eh, it's just slick back, and like, we have these massive hoops, and we have tiny little heads. Um, <laughs> true. Uh, and in France, they had horns. Um, so we started in the 1750s because that last quarter, last half of the 18th century, hairstyles just go insane. Like, hair became such an important part of, of fashion and how women and men express themselves in fashion that yeah we filled up a 200 page book and we barely scratched the surface over what was trendy what was really going on we kind of went what are the core things that we see what are the most iconic looks and we just kind of adapted to that so that very vertical hairstyle you actually see basically like 1772 to about 1774 75 by the mid 1770s, by the Revolutionary War, hair is actually starting to widen out at the top. It's still tall, but it's starting to widen out at the top. And it's starting to get um, not vertical, it's like shaped. So it's taller in the back, a little bit shorter in the front. So you can display your poof on it, which is actually the hair decoration. Uh, it's kind of like a cap, it looks like a toilet seat. Um, so, like, if you went to your grandma's house and she had that toilet seat cover, it's a poof, basically. Um, so the really, really vertical style was just a very, very short moment in time. 
The hairstyle we're going to do today is more transitional. It's about 1780, 1779 into 81, where in the early 80s, and this is something that Cheney can I bring Cheney back in to talk about this, we're starting to see the frizzy hairstyles come back, and they're starting to get wider. They're not as tall, but they're wide, and women are going there. And then eventually, like what Lauren has, her curls are a little bit bigger because uh, she hasn't craped her hair, which is a hair curling technique that white Western women would do to, well, frankly, appropriate black hair. Um, like, let's not mince the words there. Um, but then the curls got wider and bigger and softer. But if you weren't creping your hair or curling it, um, you could put it over a cushion or a roller. Um, so we're doing a cushion. I dubbed it, because I have a really weird sense of humor, I dubbed it the grub cushion because I thought it looked like a grub, but it's just brown because um, my hair is brown. Um, and so it helps give the rounded shape and the width and a little bit of height, but it's not super vertical. It's just more softer. Uh, I, I actually just like that style better. So this is a very easy way for someone who doesn't want to curl their hair to get the fashionable shape of the time without having to do the curling. Um, and the shift in hair shapes also ties into the shift in millinery. So millinery are 18th century accessories. Um, it's not just hats like we use it today. That, that word evolved in the 19th century uh, to become just hats and bonnets. Um, it co comes into mass production, industrial age, department stores, men going, oh look, women can make a lot of money, like they make a lot of money selling like decorative bits, and we're going to take it over and we're going to mass produce it and sell it for a lot less. And the milliners are like, well damn, what do we do? Um, hats, because <laughs> hat making sucks. Um, so, but the shift in hair ties into the shift in cap. So the cap that Lauren has on, the cap that I'm going to wear, it's actually a rounded shape. And it, it would not work on a conical or more straight hairstyle or a lower hairstyle because the shape of your hair supports the cap. So all of this ties in together. You can't just take a cap from 1760 and slap it on a, a hair shape from 1785. It won't work. So all of this ties in together and it's ingenious because when you're shifting these things so quickly, you as the consumer have to buy more, right? So it's a genius way for women in the 18th century because women were milliners in the 18th century. It was a, one of the only female dominated trades in the 18th century to make a lot of money. And that's what Rose Bretin was. She was a milliner um, and, and things like that. So it all ties in together. Um, any questions before I just keep on going? Sweet. So, creeping. Oh, Cheney. In, in, um, in the book, and this is something that we had talked about before, there's a hairdressing manual. It's a primary source. I probably will butcher the actual pronunciation, so I'm just going to go for it. It, it. To us, it looks like Plakakamos. And it is like this 600 page like tome. And like 50 pages are actually like relevant hairdressing information. The rest of it is him talking about people and being like, if you did this, and then again, I'm like, can you just get to the point? My dude, like, just 18th century books, man. Um, but in the middle of the book, he talks about doing a hairstyle from start to finish, cutting the woman's hair, pomading it, cleaning it, cutting it, and then creping it. Well, I, I don't know, I, I'm not familiar with, like, all the different courses at FIT, but crepe as the fabric, right? Crepe has a particular type of texture, doesn't it? It's twisted. It has that kinkiness to it. Well, okay, crepe was a really popular fabric in the 18th century as well. They talk about creping the hair. And when I experimented on doing this on um, Nicole, who is our shoe designer, but back then she was my coworker at Colonial Williamsburg, I did it. And what I saw was 4C hair, was, was hair texture very similar to what Cheney has. Um, and it was how it was twisted and pomaded and powdered and heat set. And I was like, something's wrong here. And we all can look at um, late 1780s hair and go, oh yeah, it looks like an afro. And there's been evidence that there was a tie in there, but we couldn't quite figure it out. Like, we, we were trying to find primary sources. We did. So with the essay, I was like, Cheney, like, can you please, please, like, can we figure this out? Because we need to talk about this, right? As 21st century women and men in America, we need to talk about cultural appropriation. It's a hot topic. It's something that we deal with all the time. And it's like, is this actually a new thing? And the answer is no. Would you like to talk about it? <laughs> yes. Um, so 
we know that in the 18th century, they viewed hair, your outward appearance as some, a statement of what's on the inside. Um, we, on some level, believe this, but um, we don't so much act on it. Um, how you are on your outside is where you are going to be placed in society. So a woman should be kept a very prim, proper, everything put into its place. Hair should be smooth. Um, and that was on up in... I don't have a And this, uh, all these, this stain uh, from your coffee this morning. <laughs> very terrible statement on what's on the inside. <laughs> um, so this idea that your hair um, should be perfectly coiffed. Um, but that period in the late 18th century where European women um, kinked out their hair, that's what I call it, kinking out their hair, um, you would think that that shift would also have a shift in the idea of who they are on the inside. And that's not the case. In fact, it was the fact that they were putting all these, this product into their hair, that they had to spend all this time, this money, into achieving that style that really added to elevating the idea of this style in the heads of, um, of society during that time. Whereas when African women um, who were putting their, using their hair texture to achieve these styles, um, it was considered, they were still considered to be immoral on the inside. Um, we came across many sources um, that spoke to the hair texture of African women and specifically saying um, when they speak about immoral women, they would compare it to the hair texture of African women, mm -hmm. woolly. Um, and unkempt as the Negro, the Negroid or Negro. Um, and we saw that over and over and over again in books. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just very, for me, it was very shocking then for five years later for them to actually appropriate an Afro. And we're not sure why they did that. <laughs> just, if there was a political cause for it yeah. or somebody, we're not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. why they went that direction. Yeah. Creping wasn't a new technique yeah. in 1780. Yeah. They'd been doing it in the early 18th century. Yeah. Yeah. And it was and usually still a lot of bits. For, we're still yeah. looking for that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I found that with creping, I, I, I saw that they like to add texture within mm -hmm. hair pieces. So yeah. it might have not been the whole hair, mm -hmm. but um, the they, really the like, they really like the texture, adding bits of texture. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere in the late century, they're like, Afros. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, this was a very um, interesting journey. Um, and I'm very, um, very happy that um, Lauren and Abby uh, brought me in. Um, because when I started writing... I told them, I called Abby, and I was like, I'm going to be the, the cold water on your book. You were like, excellent. <laughs> um, because um, I told them straight out the bat, um, I'm going to say exactly what I want to say. And she was like, bring on the Cheney. Um, <laughs> um, and I was very shocked that when I picked up the book, um, my essay wasn't, un wasn't changed. Um, so... Um, when you read the essay, um, it's exactly what I intended to put it in, put in, mm -hmm. and it's, um, and I, I spoke truth. Um, and I don't think that um, it takes away from the fabulousness of that period, because I think some of those hairstyles were breathtaking. But at the same time, understanding um, that the wealth mm -hmm. that put those hedgehogs 
on the top of those women's heads were from the backs of slaves. Not real hedgehogs. <laughs> Not real hedgehogs. <laughs> but it's just a guess. I call it, I call it a hedgehog because okay. it looks it's, like it's it. For like, lack of a better term. <laughs> they had hedgehogs in their hair. <laughs> no, no, they didn't. They really didn't. So, but, I, I use the bad yeah. use <laughs> So in, in Cheney's, in the book, in Cheney's essay, it intros into the frizzy hairstyle section and the Plakakamos instructions, uh, we reproduced them. Um, so it's, it's the hairstyle, I can't remember like how we have it, but it's like early 80s. It's the first frizzy hairstyle. Um, and that's the Plakakamos hairstyle. And it was hard for us because part of us was like, you know, well, I have a little bit of hair here, so let's demonstrate how this goes. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh okay. that wasn't what I was going to talk about, but okay. <laughs> this is, it's a little bit of a scary technique because the hair can break and get knotted on itself when you let it out. So what you do, and we're not frizzing her hair cell today, but we will demonstrate it. If you twisty, 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 twisty. Can everybody see this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Until it twists up onto itself yeah. into a little knot, like a little rosette thing. Yeah, like, like a tiny little bun, just super, super tightly twisted. And then what we would do if we were doing this is I would wrap this in a curling paper, papillote paper, and I would press it with a papillote iron or we would use a flat iron today. It does the same thing. Yes. So you press it, it heats up, it heats up the pomade. When the pomade cools, it sets it in this very kinky texture. And then you very, very carefully let it out when it's cool and comb it out and it goes and imagine her whole head like that. You would do creping. Different hair manuals, uh, original hair manuals, have different time frames, but you would crepe your hair every month, just at the beginning of the month, sometimes every season, whatever that means, like a full summer, I'm not sure, and your hair would stay in dress until it got so deflated that you, could, that you needed to do it again. You'd have the hairdresser come and he would do it again. There are portraits. Yeah, I, I know you want to talk about this. Yeah, I love talking about this. <laughs> um, do you want to say or do you want me to say it? Oh, I, 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 I will let you uh, go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, please don't cry my hair. Uh, <laughs> just the front, there just are, that one part. Of course, this is like the one. Like, um, <laughs> there are portraits where you can actually, once you understand what creeping is, you can actually see it and how it's worn. So my favorite example of this is I went to the Vijay Lebron exhibition a few years ago at the Met. And they had the Marie Antoinette portraits side by side, you know, the one that she did in the chemise à la reine, and then the one she did because everyone got like super aggro about it. <laughs> and they had them side by side. Did anyone else go to that exhibition? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, so you remember seeing that? I don't know if you remember the hair, but that's what, it hit me like a brick. What was fascinating is her hair was creped. That was creped hair. And in the proper port, the proper portrait, with the gray polonaise gown, her hair was freshly creped. In the chemise gown portrait, it was like old. And that's when you see like where it gets kind of droopy like, and, yeah. and there's like little curls on the end. That's an old crepe. And that's what it looks like after it's been worn for a while. Um, so it is basically like a way to perm your hair. Yeah, it's a in, crime, in the yeah. 18th, 18th century. But that's the best example. If you look at those two portraits side by side, that's a fresh crepe and an old crepe, and they were worn that way uh, fashionably. So, so it's a really, it's an interesting hair technique, um, and that's why we put it in the book, because it is, it is an important part of 18th century hairdressing, but it is a problematic yeah. point in history. Yeah. But we didn't want to hide from it. We didn't want to ignore it. We needed to talk about it and show it for the sake that this book is the book that talks about 18th century hairdressing techniques, but we also, as modern people, need to talk about the issues and as historians, we need to we need to acknowledge the problematic issues of these hairstyles. And okay. The double standard. Yeah. 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 So at this point, Abby's hair is mostly pomaded and powdered. You can see how much bigger this got, and I did this really really fast, but it's mostly there. So now we gonna we gonna dress your hair. We're gonna do it. How much time do we have? That took a while. As long as it takes. As long as it takes. Okay, four minutes. So, <laughs> That's hilarious. Really? Really? Oh my god. Well, we did get started a little bit late. Okay. So. so, for the record, and most of you have probably put this together, 
you would not do this whole thing every 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 single day. You would have this done, mm -hmm. and then you would just maintain it for a while. Yeah. Remember, people are not shampooing their hair in the 18th century. This is the shampoo, right, and the conditioner, mm -hmm. and the hairspray, everything all, all at once. Mm -hmm. It is very time consuming, but it's not something they did every day. So once it's done, and you've been styling your hair for a little while, it, it actually becomes very quickly done in the morning, you know, up, mm -hmm. cap, done, cool. If you wanted a more elaborate hairstyle, then the hairdresser would come and, and do the big hairstyle for you. There is a primary source um, from a woman, Baroness, Baroness Don, Don something, where she talks about women sleeping in their big hairstyles. Mm -hmm. That's a bit of a problematic primary source, even though it is primary, because she was writing it much later in her life, in the 19th century, and she was an extremely conservative woman and she looked on fashion with a bit of disdain despite being aristocracy. It's very difficult to sleep with your hair in dress. Very difficult to have a big cushion on there, buckles, curls, flowers, feathers, stuff woven through an entire like tableau. Like imagine how you would sleep on that. I'm, I'm a very flippy floppy sleeper. So no matter what I do, I wake up and it's like sideways, backwards, no more curls. So. We're kind of thinking like, no, they, they took their hair down, they combed it out. That's what it says to do in the manuals. And then it was put up again in the morning. Yeah. So if you had, you know, a maid or you were hiring a hairdresser, like that was a normal part of just the process. But like I said earlier, you kind of train your hair. And if you're using mostly your hair, once it's parted out and it's, it's kind of sectioned off, it's actually really easy to pop it back in. And a lot of these hairstyles, some of them you think are very complicated or actually extremely straightforward, like the very tall vertical hairstyle. That's actually a very easy hairstyle to do. It just looks fancy. It just looks really complicated, but it's actually very, very simple. The most complicated hairstyles are actually the ones from the 1780s where it's curled um, because you don't necessarily have a lot of cushion in there to, to shape the hair over. Now um, that being said, I'd say about 75% of the hair on my head today is not attached to my scalp. <laughs> well, it is technically attached because it's there. It's clipped in. It's uh, yes, it's a hair piece. That is completely historically accurate. Mm -hmm. The hairdressing manuals are often thinly veiled advertisements for the hair products that the authors would sell. So you could buy toupees, which is what I'm wearing. You could buy chignon, which is the hair at the back of the head that gets looped up or braided up. So there's a little nugget there. And you could buy buckles which are fancy weird names for the big curls that you see stuck on the side of the hair. Those take a long time. They're pretty destructive to the hair because it requires a lot of teasing, and you're going to see me do that to poor Abby's hair. But if you just bought them pre-made, you just stick them on, pin them in, and you're good to go. I did my hair in 10 minutes this morning, and I know that because I filmed it for TikTok. <laughs> 10 minutes. Okay, so. We've got Abby's hair parted out. I'm going to section off, I don't have enough clips for this. I'm going to section off some for the buckles and then we're gonna turn her around. Are you not gonna put my cushion on first? Um, I wanna section everything okay. first, but I, I actually don't have enough clips to do it. I'm only gonna do two buckles. Yeah. Are there any questions so far? I feel like we are going pretty fast even though this is taking a long time. Yeah. I have a question. How do you powder the back of your own head? It's powdered sugar shaker. <laughs> so this was actually a fun thing. Um, I remember you asking this on Instagram, I think. Did you ask this? Somebody asked this. Yeah. A guy asked this. Uh, Maybe uh, not. <laughs> so there's actually um, it is a, it's, it's a reprint of the same uh, satirical print of this old hag of a woman um, powdering her wig. And this kind of goes into like how they displayed women wearing wigs in the 18th century. Uh, women wearing wigs, um, it was never actually in a serious sense. It was usually a commentary on vanity and age or disease. Um, so usually a combination of those. They're either very, very vain and stupid, or they're old and have lost their hair or, and vain. And, or they're actually sick and they've lost their hair. Um, usually commentary on like venereal diseases and prostitutes. Um, but so this print, had this woman and she had her like big fancy wig and she you know was obviously getting ready to go I think it was like to the Pantheon or something um, 
and she's powdering it with a powdered sugar shaker. And I was like, wait a damn minute, that's genius. <laughs> um, so I, uh, yeah, like, uh, if you can find a, a modern powdered sugar shaker that has a fine, fine mesh top, um, they actually can be kind of hard to find. Uh, I've had to order mine online. Obviously, in New York City, you should be able to find everything and anything. How far forward do you want this? Oh, I don't care. Just whatever. We'll put it, we'll yeah. put it right in the middle. Um, the apex. I can't see anything. I don't want at this point. Just don't embarrass me. Um, that's all I care about. Um, I know she made a face there. Uh, and so when I was doing it myself, that's actually what I like to use. It was very messy, but it was very fast. Because I would just kind of just go to town in my shower or bathtub and just like run it through and powder it in and like just comb it and like run my hands through to get it. Uh, but that, that's actually how I, I like to do it. Um, in this case, what we're using are um, blush brushes, kabuki brushes, um, because they pick up enough of the powder um, and they can distribute it a nice amount. Um, 18th century, they used different types of puffs. So you could buy wool ones, you could buy silk ones, you could buy swan's down ones. Um, and you can still buy like swan's down puffs today, but frankly, they're not nearly as they're nice. Expensive. They're very expensive. They're not nearly as nice as what you could get. Because um, you want, the, the swan's down puff is supposed to have like really long bits and like really delicate. And like the ones you get today are much smaller, um, not nearly as nice. Sometimes you can find old vintage ones, but then they're like old vintage ones and they're so small. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so we use we started using like the kabuki brushes because, for modern people, it's the most readily available, and easy, to use. Um, but yeah, a powdered sugar shaker, that was like the coolest thing when I found that. I was like, oh, that's so neat. How wacky. So what I'm doing now is I am pinning the cushion onto Abby's head. So it feels yeah, it's, it's totally secure. Yeah, I've got her hair parted. You pinned it more than I usually do. I usually like yeah. do pins, and I'm like, oh, all right, it's fine. <laughs> we'll spin you around. We've got it parted at the apex here. Everything's pulled forward. She looks silly and funny. I like that definitely. And this is very simple. So this is a wool knit hair kind of sticks to wool, right? So it's wool knit. It's stuffed with feathers. I'm so sorry, Abby. It's stuffed oh, with feathers. <laughs> um, you could also use granulated or ground up cork. You could use wool roving. You could use down. Is that everything? Horse hair. You could use horse hair, right? Horse hair was the. It, you see, horse hair mentioned um, a lot because it, it was used in um, uh, like uh, upholstery, right? For for cushions and stuff. And it's very springy and bouncy, and it holds its shape. Every like historic stuffing has pluses it, and minuses. Yeah, it's it's a personal preference. Um, feathers I like because they mold to the head, but feathers stick out. Uh, horse hair is very light and springy. Horse hair is very itchy. Wool roving, um, not itchy. Easy to get a hold of, but it'll eventually start to felt over itself and start to stick. So it gets kind of dense and heavy and can be hard to pin through. Um, we use wool knit because, like Lauren said, hair sticks to wool, um, friction, felt, things like that. And knit is so that way we can get our hair pins through the cushion. Um, if you use like a broadcloth or a flannel, it, it might be such a tight weave that you can't actually pierce it with the hairpins. So knit obviously has natural holes woven into the, into the fabric. So you can see me pinning right into the cushion. Yeah. I can tell you from experience, even a small cushion makes a really big difference. It helps immensely with keeping the volume up, but having something to pin into that isn't just your hair mm -hmm. is really important. And it forms a base for the hat, the millinery, uh, if you're wearing a big Gainsborough straw hat, it can easily squash this airy, fairy hairstyle that I have on. So I have a cushion in here too. You probably can't see the shape of it because I've got this huge cap on, but it does ensure that my hairstyle will not be deflated or, or smashed by what I'm wearing on top of it. Okay. Any questions so far about what we're doing? Did you go temporary, lady blue, then temporarily blind? No. Okay, let me turn you around. Question in the back. Yeah. Questions? Sure. Yeah. So, how did you dress your hair for the very first reenactment event you ever went to? I wore a horrible polyester wig. <laughs> that was a long time ago. How many years? How many years ago? Yeah. 
I started doing historic costuming in 2008-ish, 9-ish. Um, there was very, very little information about any historic costume on the internet back then, and so we kind of set out to figure stuff out. Um, there was no hairdress published hairdressing information that was not um, original primary source. And back then, Google Books didn't exist, so I couldn't look stuff up. And I did not have access to Echo, which you guys, I think, all have access to 18th century collections online. So take advantage of that while you are in college. That's where all the hairdressing manuals are. You can find some on Google Books now. Yeah. I'm going to tease this a bit. Oh, that's fine. Um, the one I remember was, I was a, it's a bright young thing. And it was like 2007, so like Marie Antoinette, the movie had just come out. Mm -hmm. And there was the whole thing about like them using the Bumble and Bubbles dry shampoo and white. Mm -hmm. And I was obsessed. Like I looked all over and I drug my, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky originally. I drug my mom all over that city looking for that Bumble and Bumble. And at that point in time, like there was like no like Sephora or Ulta, you know, where now you can get Bumble and Bumble like anywhere. Like, gas stations now you can get like mumble mumble uh, but I, I mean like it was like going into the depths of like the salon world in Louisville trying to find mumble mumble white spray because I was obsessed with it and I mean frankly it does not it's not a bad job like in a pinch you know but that was that was it and just like you know poly poly roving in like a hairnet you know, bright white, and like it's, you, your hair does like the cowlick part, and like there's like the bright white, like poly, like sticking out. Oh, yeah, that kind of stuff. So, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, it's a journey. And what's great about like dress history and, and, and 18th century like hair is that it's completely new, really. Like, there's not that much research published about it. Um, it's, it's a brave new world and there's so much to find and there's so much to read and research and there's so much to know and some people might be kind of scared of this but one of the things I actually kind of like about our books is the fact that I know in like 20 years they won't necessarily be completely correct anymore like the latest research that someone like hopefully someone will read the book and be inspired by it but then they'll go off and do their own research and then they'll be like those crazy ladies at American Duchess were just, oh my god, how could they? You know, and it's like, well, we used to have access to that document because it wasn't found yet, you know? Um, Sorry, from the front. <laughs> that's all that matters, right? I'm putting a cap on, who cares? Um, so, I ran out of hair on this side. <laughs> so, you know, that's the exciting thing about 18th century hairdressing and dress history just in general. There's so much information. Um, and I'm like, hi, April. So, what, what do you have any like hairdressing manuals? Like, and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, there's plenty of research to, to consume. It's, it's, it's not done, it's completely Brave New World. Any other questions? Yeah. The washing out. <laughs> what did they do to wash all of it out? They didn't. They didn't. Um, so, that's something that. Um, it's hard for us to wrap our brains around. It is. But 18th century hair care was pomade and powdering. That's how you cleaned your hair. This is clean hair. This is how you cleaned your scalp. This is how you took care of your hair. You did not wash it out unless you had to. Now you do see uh, recipes for like tonics to, to dye your hair for medical reasons. So the idea of washing your hair is tied in to, to medicine. Um, and in hairdressing manuals, you'll see like, well, if you're gonna wash in like fresh water, like that's okay. Don't wash it in salt water. Do not bathe in salt water. Do not put your hair in salt water. And once oh, salt water is so brutal on like normal, like clean hair. Beach waves. Remember, this is how you make baked goods. <laughs> I got fat and I got starch. I have a pie on my head. Um, and when you think about when you're doing the dishes and like you've cooked something really greasy, what happens when you just rinse it with water? It just feeds right yeah, it doesn't get clean. It actually just gets grosser. Yeah. You have to have the detergent to cut the grease. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't really have that. So if you just got your hair wet, it would just ugh. like and and the irony is is like, okay, well when you wash your hair, put a lot of powder in it to absorb all the moisture and get it as dry as possible, then pomade and powder your hair like immediately afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, so it wasn't until the turn of the century that and this ties in again with science and medicine, the concept of hygiene that idea starts to shift. 
and the idea of washing your hair for cleanliness value is starting to become a normal thing within medicine. Um, and so in the 18th century, you, you didn't just to do it. You, you did it for other very specific reasons. So when they took a bath, they just didn't get Yeah, you just wet. don't get your hair wet. You know, you wash yourself. Um, oh, there's like a whole box somewhere. Um, so when you wash yourself, you know, it's a, it's a washcloth and soap, like water, your face, your hands, your bits. And bathing and like complete, submerging your body into water wasn't super common. Washing was, and that's a very important distinction because people go, oh my God, they didn't bathe. And my response to that was always, well, do you take a bath every day? And most people go, no. There was that one woman that one time that was like, oh yeah, I take a bath every day, like me. And I'm like, well, that's a nice life. <laughs> uh, how luxurious. But we shower, right? Yeah. We don't bathe. We shower. And that's the same kind of thing in the 18th century when it comes to cleaning. Now, 21st century, to get this out of my hair, I learned a really good trick from my mom um, that I would put, I put the shampoo in my hair when it's dry mm -hmm. and I like wash it when it's dry because I don't have water to basically act as a barrier between the detergent and the pomade and powder. Mm -hmm. So it can help cut that grease really, really quickly. Uh, then I get my hair wet, rinse it, and then I shampoo again. So usually like a two, a two shampoo if you really want to get most of it out. Uh, but without fail, there's usually always like a spot back there in the back of your scalp that still has pomade after a shampoo and condition. Um, but it's, a, it's an 18th century. Like it's a modern way to do it because as modern people, that's what we do. Okay, real quick, um, you guys saw me tie her hair with an elastic hairband. We're using an elastic hairband because we are in a rush. But if you want to do it the HA way, you would use the Okay, yep, I'll drop it a bit. There we go. You don't have enough hair to do that. It's a cap coverage. Okay. Um, you could use like a leather thong or a piece of um, like wool, uh, like yarn to do it, to hold the hair. We don't have that on us, so we're doing it this way. Okay. So this is the chignon. You could do the chignon part of this. I pinned that terribly. In any number of ways. You could do three braids up the back. You could do... A, a low braid like I've got, you could just do a loop, you could do sort of like a twisty loop. There are a lot of different options there. I'm not being particularly perfect back here because we're going to put a cap over this. So it doesn't really matter. No. Yeah. And that's the nice thing about caps is people, people go, oh, these big elaborate hairstyles. I'm like, yeah, I can throw a cap on it. Like, no one sees most of it. It's not a big deal. So that is the chignon. Okay. Any questions so far about the back of the head? Because it's about to get weird. Okay. Chignon is the easy part. All right. Another little modern cheat is bobby pins. They did not exist back then. So far up to this minute, I've been using hair pins, which did. Hair pins are just these nice U-shaped loops of wire. In the 18th century, you could get them in a bazillion different sizes, really, really long ones, little tiny short ones. You can just get these at like Sally Beauty Supply, really easy. And the technique with these hairpins is you kind of twist and weave and turn back on itself to get these to stay in. When you're having a hard time, if you're doing this on yourself, you use a bobby pin and you just you cheat. You stick it in. It's a bit of a cheater method, don't tell anybody. Okay, so now we're going to do the buckles. <laughs> Question, anybody? Nope, okay. So the buckles. The buckles, I first came across description of buckles in two hairdressing manuals where one basically copies the other, plagiarizes the other, and they talk about the buckles being used to warm this area of the neck for a writing style. It does make sense if you've ever worn buckles. Anybody here ever worn hair buckles uh, right behind their ears? I made the mistake of doing that at Jane Austen Festival in Kentucky in July one year, and I was roasty, roasty, roasty hot, so they definitely do keep your neck warm. The technique for doing these, if you haven't bought them from Richie's book, um, is to tease the hair up until it resembles what we might call a dreadlock today. I've only just begun. You want to tease this and pomade it 
powder it until it stands out on its own. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Abby. So this is a process of ratting the hair and then I'm going to roll it up with a tool here in just a moment. Okay. This is this is the intense part, so I'm going to be quiet for a minute. Yeah. So the idea is that you can see that the pomade powder is giving my hair enough texture that it's holding the tees pretty well, but you it, you basically do want it to stick out on its own, um, and it becomes very sculptural. Um, and since it's so teased, is it sticking out? Sweet. Mm -hmm. I should do the other side before we roll them up. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, do it for the gram. So, um, so that way when it comes to curling it, it's easy. And it also holds better when it's pinned. Um, buckles are, are, are like, we're not going to mince words. Buckles are really tricky to do on your hair. And when we were writing the book, the buckles always came last. And end photographing. End of a very long day. At the end of a very long day. And if anyone was going to cry. It was me. It was, you. it was me. <laughs> I was always the one that was like, I need to go have some me time. And it was when we were doing the buckles. Uh, because you can always get one side. And then the other side just is like, no, forget if you're, about if it. If you're starting from scratch, they are, they're difficult. If you've been doing your hair for a week, for a few days, and it's trained, like Abby was talking about, they become really easy. They're like, oh, yes, I wish to be curled again. <laughs> Here I am. I'm back. Um, but starting from scratch like this, this is pretty intense. The finer the hair, the harder it is to get it to hold the tees as well. So already it's sort of like, do I have this tease enough? We'll see. It's fine. Okay. If it's sticking out, it's, it's it is sticking out. Now. We got a little dangle dangle there. Yeah, that's fine hair. It's fine. Whatever. In the 18th century, if they had little like bits of hair hanging off, they'd be like, just cut them. Yeah. We're not going <coughs> to do that. We can talk about haircuts. So, yeah. Okay. I'm going to turn you around this way. So turn all the way around. Yeah. What was the length of the hair back then? Perfect segue. We, we were just getting ready to play. Yeah. Um, Before you go into that, I have a curling iron. It's plugged into the electrical outlet. We've had a question about are curling irons accurate? Yes, they are. But of course, you would heat this in a brazier, which I used to call brazier because I never <laughs> heard it said before. A brazier, um, which you have to be very careful when you're heating something over the fire because it can get too hot and it can singe the hair off, and there are yeah. stories about that. Yeah. We don't have that problem with electricity, so we are using this yeah. for the sake of yeah. not having a, like a coal burning mm -hmm. brazier in here. Um, so haircuts in the 18th century are fascinating because I think a lot of people assume everyone had beautiful long hair. The reality is, is they didn't. They had mullets. They had <laughs> mullets. Um, the most hideous like party <laughs> mullet ever is an 18th like, century haircut. Yeah. So like in the Pulkakamos thing, I, I mentioned earlier, he actually talks about how to cut the hair. And he talks about cutting the hair as short as a half inch in the very, very front. And then slowly shagging the hair to be longer. Because when you're doing a frizzy hairstyle, having long hair is actually very, very difficult. Like you would never crepe. My hair is too long to crepe. It's way too long to crepe. Your hair is great to crepe. I think it's just short, right? Or is it a pullback? No. Your hair is actually almost too long to crepe. Long in the front mm -hmm. and short in the back. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to like look. It's not good anybody. Anybody, anybody like, with a pixie maybe cut? My, like, like maybe these hairs. Yeah. Like that's perfect crepe length. Um, because it'll stick out and it won't fall forward. They do stick out. Um, yeah. So for that, it's actually a very extreme mullet and shag. Um, the only time that super, super long hair, like your hair, your hair, my hair is getting there eventually one day, maybe. Um, is, is the 1770s, um, when you're t having a very tall um, and it's going over to large cushions. That's when it's, it's actually useful. But actually having, having shorter hair in the front is, is much better for 18th century. Even in the earlier part, like if we go to like Madame Pompadour and, and those styles, they actually are, again, very short in the front, around the face, and then they're longer in the back. Um, so, so it's um, so yeah. Haircuts are an important part, and that's something that as like modern people we have to like deal with. So in our book, we actually always have a before and after photo, so people can see what the hair of the person looked like. Because um, that's something that we do actually get a lot. Is well, I have really really short hair. Can I do this? Absolutely. I have really really long hair. Can I do this? Absolutely. 
Um, because no one actually has 18th century haircuts. Um, so, so yeah, it's, 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 it's not just super long. There, there's definitely like strategy. There's her first tiny little buckle. My baby buckle. Now I pulled a little bit of hair out here to do this and they actually ended up smaller than I thought they would. Um, we've done them with women that have very long hair. We do the very high hairstyles on. And it's surprising how chunky and big they get. And you do see that in portraiture too, like these big old eggs, like right under the ears. You see portraits and drawings where they have a lot of different buckles on the head. They're like all stacked up the back. We don't have time for that today, but I guarantee you some of those are real and some of those are not real. You physically cannot pull hair from that part of the hairstyle to make exist. a buckle out of it. So we're just doing two little twee ones and we're actually almost done. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see the hand. Uh, I have a question about um, how to... First off, um, I've tried doing buckles in my hair a couple of times, and I found I actually didn't need to tease my hair. Is that just because nice. I have more texture? Um, potentially, yeah. Um, I mean, I've done buckles before without teasing my hair. You end up with a different aesthetic. It looks different. Mm. And you do see both kind of styles. So it's, it's a, it's, I think it comes down to personal, but when you read the instructions, for how to do buckles and dressing manuals. It talks about going through this process, which is why we reproduce it. But you do visually also see a portraiture. They don't look like, smooth ones. like really smooth ones. Yeah. So, so I wouldn't stress about it. Follow your bliss if it works for you. Um, now we did not tease um, the African hair. Mm -mm. Don't tease African hair. <laughs> I just, I had the privilege of actually observing buckles being done on a, on a woman who is African American uh, last week. And it was, um, I think the only problem she had was we had to get more pomade in to mm -hmm. kind of weigh it down a mm -hmm. little bit because yeah. we needed to stretch our hair. Yeah. And that's something that um, next time when we do it, we're probably going to stretch our hair using wrappings before so that's a very funny problem on the other end they're trying to get um, it tease more and on the other end we're trying to yeah. um, get it straightened before we start the buckles yes we actually had that same issue for the woman uh, of color that we did um, Jasmine. Jasmine's hair uh, in the book in the book yeah. and because we were like, oh, well, we'll just curl them up. Like, right, we don't right. need to add texture. Da, da, da. But yeah, we ended up having to hit it very quickly with a flattening iron right, right. to like, because it was like, it, we couldn't contain it. But we didn't. We, we were like, we can't tease it. So it was like, yeah, add more pomade and hit it very quickly yeah. with a curling iron. And then, yeah, they were perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And so you get it that is a happy medium. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And that was something, yeah, we learned on the fly. You can't, yeah. you don't know that until you do it. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of things that we've had to do that it's just, trial and error and a lot of error. Yeah. <laughs> you learn a lot when you fail. Yeah. So much. So much learning. Okay. Um, so you discussed that you wouldn't wear your hair like this to sleep. So how do you, when you take it out at the other day, how do you style it to sleep? Lauren. Ah. Your favorite subject. My favorite, one of my favorite yeah. subjects. Um, well, Abby has a, a practical experience with this for hair of the 1770s. So the straight hair that she's got now, which is how she wore her hair a lot at Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. If you had your hair craped, you would fillet it. So we ran across this term a lot in the hairdressing manuals. They didn't necessarily say what it meant, so I went down the rabbit hole of what filleting meant. And it's, it's actually very simple, and you'll see this a lot in prints. You would tie a band of fabric around your hair. So you'd have a, a perm, right? A really tight, like 4C or 3C semi perm and you would just tie under the chin a wide piece of fabric linen silk something that you sleep in those are not for toothache guys <laughs> they often depict that in movies it's it's for filleting the hair you get up in the morning and you get your your hair pick essentially and you just you just pick it out and it, it does work um, my hair piece that I'm wearing my toupee I have not curled it for this trip. It's been in a shoebox. And I opened the shoebox and I was like, oh, it looks really sad. It was all matted. And I just picked it out. It went, and it's not crepe, it's just curled. 
So that's how they were keeping hair in dress for that long. It also keeps the hair clean. Um, you have pin curled your hair before and you've worn a headscarf to keep your pin curls in place overnight. Yes, I do that all the time. It's the same idea except you didn't, you didn't have to pin it because your hair is really only this long. So that's how they do it. For Abby's hair, you take it down. Again, it's, it's actually pretty simple. You comb it through. The combing is really important. You tie it up in some way. How did you tie it? Well, I was bad about combing. I mean, full disclosure. Um, like I said, I, I wasn't actually a very good 18th century hy hy hygiene. I was, that's because you're morally like, corrupt on the inside. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm a dirty girl. Uh, that milliner life. Um, no. <laughs> made a joke there. Um, but I, I kind of left it parted out and I always kind of pin the bits up. So like the buckles, obviously they're really easy to, to pull out, but I would just kind of pin everything up and out of the way um, and just sleep with it that way. Keeping it in a scarf always helps contain it um, and keep the powder in. But yeah, and then that was it. And then literally once it's all parted out and, and this, you just kind of all right, pin the cushion back in, flop it back over, the hair, everything just kind of goes back into place because it's spent the whole day there. So it actually is very easy to do. Um, so yeah, just fillet it, tie it down. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So like back then, if a woman like, had curly hair, would they have had to have like, straighten the hair in order to do this? No, what's actually really interesting about curly hair and pomade and powder is that the powder will start to weigh the curls down. Um, so, and curly hair is good. It has texture and things like that. Um, so the powder would kind of end up weighing it down a little bit, but you'd still have the wave texture. And you would just work with that. Like that's, so depending on what, how curly your hair is. Um, but I dressed a, a guy's hair once who had very, kind of like the most beautiful hair. So jealous. It's always like, ugh. Um, but this beautiful curly hair, and by the time I was done combing it and pomading and powdering it, it was just wavy. And he looked like he had a peruke from the 17th century on, like that's what it looked like. Like those kind, it was gorgeous, gorgeous. And it went up into the hair very, very easily. And he had a little bit like curly like flyaways, but like I have straight hair and I have flyaways, and flyaways are a normal thing in 18th century hairdressing. Like it's, that kind of texture is normal. So yeah, you don't straighten it or anything, you just, it, the pomade powder will weigh it down, but you just work with it, and it's fine. Okay. So, okay. at this point, Abby's hair is dressed, but it's not finished. I'm going to apply a bit more. Did I do a good job? I have no idea. I can't see myself. Good enough. Am I okay? Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. I'm like, you have the tiniest like... little buckles back here. Um, so I'm just going to hairspray the front of this. Can you put some pressure forward while oh. I do this? Thank you. A little bit more pomade. Okay. To my Joan Rivers impression. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to do a final application of powder. And what? Oh, <laughs> yeah, we can move it. Um, since she's going to do this, I, I want to take a second to talk about cosmetics because we haven't talked about cosmetics. Um, 18th century beauty. The concept of beauty was about. It's very 21st century as well. Um, it's about celebrating your natural beauty and taking care of what you have and celebrating what you have and, and highlighting the good bits. But it's, people like lean very heavily on the lead, like white lead paint and da 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 da, da like the bright rouge. I have 18th century rouge on right now. I have no lead paint on right now. This is just my skin. I have concealer on because jet lag. Uh, but when you pomade and powder your hair, have you noticed my skin and like my features have kind of shifted a little bit because of the powdering of the hair? All of a sudden my eyebrows are taking prominence. My eyes kind of pop out a little bit more. The rosiness in the cheeks just helps me not look dead. Um, and then a little bit of lip color. But it really actually, I find, it highlights the features of your face. And it's very, I think it's very attractive. Like I actually think pomade and powdered hair, because it's just like, this is my face. This is, this is it. This is, this is what I am. And by darkening your eyebrows a little bit, by putting on the rouge, it just amplifies that natural glow, that natural beauty from within, right? You don't want to have too much because then that's not morally okay. But you need to do a little bit to kind of balance. So you see a lot of rouge recipes, lip color recipes. Um, Toilet to Floor is a great resource because it was a book published to make your own at home. And lip colors, 
all sorts of rouges, pomades and powders, different kind of skin creams, cold creams to take care of your skin, um, things like that. Lead, white lead face paint for makeup. They actually understood in the 18th century that lead was problematic, that lead was causing problems. And there are newspaper articles and things written about like, don't use lead beauty products. It actually will damage your skin, it's not good for you. But just like today, we can read about how, you know, people will have silicone poisoning from getting like implants and they leak or a bad Botox job. You know, like Botox is, it's poison, right? And we're like, ooh, no wrinkles, right? And so people, some people do it and some people go, don't do that, that's like really bad for you. It's the same thing in the 18th century. Some women like, oh, I don't care, screw it. I wanna lighten up my face. Maybe I have some skin damage or something and I wanna do that. Another one are like, no. So, but everything they, they write about, it's about amplifying what you have. I like that kind of glow. Uh, hmm. We're gonna put some pins. There might be some in my, so I'm good. Um, so, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, yeah, the rouge recipes from the 18th century are like stellar. Like this color, this, this recipe that we have in the book, it's a very easy one to make. It's very inexpensive. If you want like a really cheap like Christmas gift for like all your friends, just like make some rouge and be like, here's some rouge for you. Here's some rouge for you. Here's some rouge for you. Five years later, here's some rouge for you. <laughs> we brought some so you guys can yeah. play with this. See it. Just um, be careful that you don't splatter it on anything. It, it will stain. It stains. Um, it's made out of brandy. Yeah. It's an alcohol base. We have sandalwood and, and Brazil wood or Logan wood. So it, we have like the orangey red mixed with like a purpley red and the alcohol and the alum and the gum benjamin. And it actually, I find it to be extremely flattering for all skin tones. Every model in the book wore it. And we have a very wide array of, of coloring. Um, so it's not just like only good for one. It actually, I find it to be extremely flattering for, for everybody. Um, you are done. She's done. Yay, I'm done. Yay. Bits, so, so, so yeah, we have, like I said, some cosmetics, but but we don't have a lot because in the 18th century you don't actually need a lot. And yeah, to celebrate what you got, wear some rouge, pomade powder your hair, finger good. Cool. cool. Any last questions? Yeah. Uh, how much of this is, are you, somebody else uh, how, how much of this is also applicable Quite a bit of it. Quite a bit of it. So the styles weren't as elaborate, obviously, but you could use this on wigs if you want to wear a peruke. You can use it on, you've got plenty of hair to do it. Yeah. So when you pomade and powder your hair, the problem that you're going to have is your hair cut because it's not short in the front, like you're not willing to do that. Right? I, I don't know, maybe know you are. I'm supposed to. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, mean, so, I haven't cut it in about a year and a half. Cause yeah. I'm yeah. So there's actually a fantastic <laughs> portrait of George Washington at the Frick where he has a fresh powder on, mm -hmm. and it's all over his collar. So that they, it is definitely applicable to men. Make the products or buy the products and try it, because your hair is just going to be, your hair is going to be huge. Mm -hmm. You go, wow, this is great. If you have fine hair, it's, it's fantastic. Her hair is going to feel so deeply conditioned and so lovely, even after she takes it down. It's a really interesting experience. Any other questions about what we've just somehow successfully done in front of an audience. <laughs> <laughs> After not doing it for a very long time. <laughs> I, I missed how you secured the buckles. Is it just pins again? Ah, you did not miss it because I, I did not explain it. This is an interesting discovery that we made. So you roll up the buckle, and I'm not sure that I can show this in an effective way. Um, it's illustrated in our book, I will it, say that. It's a little difficult to understand. So you've rolled it up, right? And you you grab the outside of the underside of the buckle. So you put this over the edge and then you turn it and you weave it in and out on the back side of it. And then you do it from the other side and they sort of interlock to hold it in place. We had a lot of experimentation with trying to hold the buckles in place because they don't necessarily want to behave. Like yes, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. so if you do victory rolls, you know, well, like did. tonight or something, <laughs> right? U-shaped hairpins, there's two different sizes. We use the big honking ones for big buckles. And you catch the edge and then you turn it and go in and out. And this motion is a lot of how to make these hairpins work. 
And Abby taught me this one. And then you, sometimes you want to go in and turn, not necessarily with a buckle, but in general, turn it so it goes down mm -hmm. with the gravity. So down this way, right? Mm -hmm. It helps hold it in place. I used a couple bobby pins in her hairstyle. Um, it, when we first started, we used a lot of bobby pins, and we actually learned that they were not as effective as the U-shaped hairpins, so long as you, you kind of figure out the twisting and weaving motion of yeah. these. Yeah, that, that inform, uh, I'm back of my hair. So that information about the hairpins is actually really cool. That's in hairdressing manuals. And so they're verbally describing it, and then we trying have to figure to, out how they're talking. like what? <laughs> so, so yeah. Yeah. So most of the back part is covered. Yeah. Ironically, but the front yeah. looks good. That's all that matters. <laughs> now, if you were a working woman in the 18th century, you might do a more reserved version of this. But this, but this is not aristocratic hairstyle. She's not dressed as an aristocrat. She's not a rich woman. She's just a normal milliner. She's just a normal working woman. Mm -hmm. I think people think working class women and they think farmers' wives or mm -hmm. uh, you know, fishmongers. But working class women describes the middle tier as well. Mm -hmm. It's a very easy hairstyle to do. It actually took longer than it would then because they would do this stuff every day. Well, and we're, they were not like talking to people, yeah. right? And we had yeah. to pomade and powder it, but it took longer to pomade and powder her hair than it did for me to do her hair. So it is pretty easy. You just doop, put a cap on and you're done, mm -hmm. out the door. Yeah. And if I didn't want to wear a cap, if I wanted just to kind of like wrap some bits of gauze or feathers in my hair, then we would take more time to curl the bits and arrange them so they're nice and neat, hide the ends, fold things a certain way, and stuff like that. So you just take a little bit more care. but. I mean, they wore a lot of caps and, and bits yeah. on their hair for good reason. So. You've got to think about it this way. When you get up in the morning and it's like, oh. it's Saturday, oh. I'm going out tonight. I'm going to maybe go to the salon and get a blowout if you're that type of person. I'm maybe going to curl my hair. I'm maybe going to, you know, I'm going to wash my hair and I'm going to like do something nice because I'm going out tonight. You get to Sunday and you're like, brunch. I'm going to put on a hat. I'm going to put on a ponytail, no makeup. I'm going to put on a hat. They did that too. They did that too. So it's one day you have big coiffure, the next day you're like, eh, I'm just gonna put a cap on and you know my biggest, most bodacious cap, and I'm gonna shuffle off to buy ribbons or something. I yeah. don't know, whatever. You they had a really did. good time at the ball the night before, and you're like, eh, I'm yeah. hung over. You're like, eh, I'm just gonna lay in bed all day. Yeah. If you Screw go it. to, you know, prom, who remembers their prom? You went and had your hair done, right? But it's maybe not an everyday thing for for a middle class or a lower class person, but it is a special occasion. If you are Meghan Markle, you might have your hair done every day because you're, you're up there, right? So it, I think people often think that the people in the past thought differently, that they had different needs on a, on a basic level, but they weren't that different from us. That's really important to remember. Okay, any last questions? Did we not cover anything that anybody was interested in? Yeah. I don't even know how to frame this question, but I always wonder the difference between the bright white powder on some portraits, it seems like that was earlier, and then the shift to more natural hair. That's a, that's a great question. We do talk about it a bit in the book, very <laughs> observant. Yes, heavily powdered hair for French women in the middle of the century was a thing. There's even a primary reference where they're mixing the pomade and the powder together first on the hands to make like a paste and then applying it to the hair and you just really like powder, powder, powder. You go for it. Like, <laughs> we're very light with not, our powder Not so much for English women in the middle of the century. 1770s rolls around, you have a lot of powder going on and then it does sort of fade off. Mm -hmm. You have portraits in the seven, late 1780s and 90s where they're still heavily powdering their hair, some people, and you have portraits where they're barely powdering or not powdering at all. Well, it's, 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 it's a very light powder application. because like if there's a colored powder. Yeah, and the other thing is there's colored hair powders in the 18th century, too. So you have, we have a Marie Shawl recipe that we kind of like brought together from different ones. It's brown. I've seen recipes for black, uh, yellow, um, pink, blue, purple. Like, they, they use colored powders. The problem with the colored powders is that they have painter's pigments in them. So it's a safety issue today. So that's why we don't include one that has like burnt umber in it. Um, also, I learned the hard way that when you mix shocking painter's pigment with fat, what do you get? Paint. Um, 
So you have to do the common pomade first. Um, and the other thing is, is like the person's hair color underneath. Um, I have really, really dark hair. Yeah. But I do have like not artificial highlights in my hair and you can probably see the parts that were the bleaches, it looks more white than it does with the natural dark. So if you're a natural blonde or you yeah. have like the lighter well, brown hair. If we were to pop and pal your hair, yeah. it would be like pink to pink, white. Pinkish color. Yeah. It would be so light. The woman on the front of our book has hair your color. And you can yeah. see it became kind of this pinky, like strawberry blondeness. Whiteness. Just, yeah, just. sort of, it very like cloud-like. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, Marie Antoinette actually had strawberry blonde hair, mm -hmm. and so applying just normal pomade and powder to her hair, which was unfortunately a, a very um, unfashionable color, red hair, was not something people wanted. They wanted black hair. Even though they the liked time. pink hair powder. It's like, whatever. But on black hair. Um, her being queen with her strawberry blonde hair coming out very, very light and white did affect fashion. And so some of that is, it's why you get horse hair, like light white and light colored blonde horse hair being used for wigs, is the light color became sort of this, is it the hair or is it the powder? It could, it may be a little bit of A, a little bit of column B. But you are right, it does, it does deplete over time, mm -hmm. which is a very interesting change in hygiene towards the end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th century. There's a lot of scientific research on bathing in the Regency period, you get bathing in the sea, which was like, do not bathe in the sea in the 18th century. When you go deeper, mm -hmm. they're washing their hair with pomade and powder. So what happens when they stop doing that? How do they clean their hair? And it shifts into this, this more modern idea that we have of cleaning our hair today. Does that answer the question? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why do people want to be dark? Why white? Why do they want white? Well, it's kind of like the aftermath of what happens when you pomade and powder their hair. Like why it went white, like why they did that. I, I don't think we've ever come across like the why behind it, but it does tie into hygiene and I think it's a natural result. And then I think it just became trendy to add more and more and more. Because like, I don't know how heavily powdered my hair is right now, but it's not nearly as powdered as it could be. And you can do a very, very light application and still have very similar results. And like, so I think it's a mix of fashion, it's a mix of hygiene. You know, why, why do we do what we do now? You know, like why do we, why do we want to dye our hair pink? Why do some people want perms? Why do some people, you know, do this or do that? It's kind of, it's fashion. Oftentimes it is tied to a monarch or somebody influential that is in the aristocracy. Uh, Madame du Barry was a blonde. If you ever saw Marie Antoinette, she's like this dark beauty. It's not actually correct, she was a blonde. Marie Antoinette was a strawberry blonde. You have other people of fashion who are, are really trailblazing. They're going after the poofs, they're going after, they're like, oh, Leonard, yeah, come do my crazy hair stuff, put stars in it, sweet. And they have very, very light hair. It might be because of that. We haven't looked far, far back into really anything outside of France and England for hair, but the Italians were very, very, very powdered. And I'm not sure why. I would like to learn why. If, was there somebody like in, the cause in their it. culture that had white hair or very, very light hair, very closely curled with heavy powder application? Not sure. Not sure. So it's, yeah. it definitely bears more research. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take it out tonight. Um, I'll pin it up, uh, but we're doing another presentation tomorrow, so I'm just set to go for tomorrow. Okay. Um, and when I leave New York City and I'm flying through the airport and I'm leaving a trail of powder behind me, I'll have it twisted up in a way that I just like to do it as my normal thing. I just kind of, I don't wear it down, I wear it up, but I, I have a way that I like to keep my hair uh, when it's not just like modern, blown out. That's, yeah. that's it, it's just kind of vintage -y. I own it and it works. Holds it really well. Don't need hairspray. Very few hairpins. It's great. Yeah. So. You didn't have any problems in like Virginia with the heat melting it out. No, because the starch absorbs all the moisture. Oh, okay. Yeah, you yeah, just keep putting more powder on it. Yeah. Like any chemical. I mean, if you want to touch it, my hair is very dry right now. Like it's not wet or anything. Oh, no, it's not. Yeah. No. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed it and maybe learned something or got curious yeah. about something. If you'd like to come up and and 
see any of this stuff, um, check out the book. Ask some more questions one on one. You're more than welcome. Um, we really appreciate it. It's great yes. to see you guys. And thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.